Hi, I'm Nora Bashara from Upcycle Design School, and I'm really excited to have Stephen Bethel as our guest this month on the workshop. And Stephen and I met at a summit a few weeks ago that was all about circularity and sustainability. And we realized that we shared a lot of the same mission and values and goals. And he is the owner of a large secondhand um, sorting and collecting business, as well as 13 vintage stores in London and upcycled manufacturing, which um, at scale, which is very cool. And not a lot of people are doing that yet. So um, I will let you um, take over and do a more thorough introduction. <laughs> That's cool. No, it's like, I think there's something really beautiful where you find a, another tribes person you go to New York, you know, Laura Siegel has her event and says, uh, and says, Hey, do you want to, you want to, you know, come and you can meet another tribes person, somebody that's as excited as we are about upcycling. It's really great. So yeah, so, so to start off, um, I am Steve Bethel. I'm the co-founder of a, a group of companies, family of companies. The parent company is called Bank and Vogue and we buy and sell secondhand clothes. Uh, we sell about 3 million garments a week of used clothes around the world. And, um, but about 20 years ago, actually 20 years this year, we started um, Beyond Retro. And our whole hope uh, with Beyond Retro is, could we represent the trends of the day through used? Could, could part of the landscape of fashion be vintage? And then about 10 years ago, um, you know, one of the challenges about a vintage store is you can only sell what you find. So there were, there were trends that we wanted to execute on and product that we got through that was amazing product, but maybe it was oversized or maybe it was damaged is could we cut those up and turn them into relevant products for our own stores? So we have stores in, uh, throughout the UK and throughout Sweden. And, uh, we also have an online channel, which is beyondretro.com. And the real, the, the, the mission with the upcycling was, could we take some of the amazing fabric that we can't resell or can't uh, repair and could we turn them into new things? And as you said, we have to wear our fashion. This is a, a vintage, uh, this is a, um, a, a vest that was made from uh, workwear fabric. And it was, a, it was, a, 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 it was, was in its previous life, uh, a pair of trousers. And uh, now it's a, a workwear uh, vest. I'm a big fan of vests. And um, and then I guess the last thing, just to sort of share this, it's not relevant as relevant to this, but the other body of work that the companies are doing is we're putting a lot of energy into if we can't resell it in one of the international markets or in our own stores, we can't repair it or remanufacture it. Can we uh, have used as an input to new fibers? this idea of fiber to fiber recycling. So working with the likes of a Renew Cell who are taking cotton uh, or cellulose rich product and using it as an input to uh, the viscose fiber process. And what, what Renew Cell, what's exciting about what they've done is they figured out a technology to replace uh, wood pulp with secondhand clothes and make viscose fiber with it. So this concept of circularity is really what what the what the group of companies uh that <clears throat> that we're all trying to run on is this mission of innovative and relevant solutions to the crisis of stuff what do you what do you do with all the clothes once they can't be resold in a local charity and that's that's been our focus uh but did you Nora? would you did you want to talk about the upcycling now what would you what would you want to where do we want to go um, sure. Uh, if you want to start with, go on to, um, textile hierarchy, resale, repair, upcycle, downcycle. Yeah. Or did you... yeah, let's, yeah, let's, so, so, you know, part of our mission as, um, as a company is we want to find the highest value hierarchy for an item. And one of the, one of the, one of the, 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 you know, one of the things that can't be lost is that, um, 
you know, somebody asked, how would you start your thrifting journey? And I would, I would first, the first conversation that's really important and, and has lost a little bit of modernity is that, you know, put your, your, if you can't share your clothes with a friend or, or swap them with a buddy, uh, make sure you put them in a, in a, in a, in a bag and bring them down to your local thrift operator, uh, your local charities. You know, those charities are really an important part of uh, the circular economy. I mean, Saturday night, uh, you know, two nights from now, um, I'm not going to be handing out uh, sandwiches and coffee to the homeless at two in the morning, but charities like the Salvation Army, they, they need your products so they can generate revenue to carry on their missions. And I, I feel like it's something that often gets lost in the conversation about, especially in, in an era where we're all folks, we're all fixated on new high-tech solutions or new uh, platforms or new blah, blah, blah. But your clothes as a beginning of the journey, once you're, you're done with them and you can't share them amongst your friend network, they really do have purpose for the charities in your community. I don't know, I feel like that's always a, a first place to start. But the, one of the things I think people were, would be surprised about is that a typical thrift operator, uh, like a Salvation Army or a Goodwill, really only sell about 25 to 30% of what they get donated. What happens to the other 70%? So, uh, and I, I feel like that's a really important conversation. There's, there is a, a big, and so what we do at Bank of Focus, we try to find homes for either the product that the charities get too much of, which we refer to as originals, or we try to find homes for the mixed rags, the products that have been through the thrift store, the cream has been digging out, but how do we sort that product and what's, what's in it? And, and this is where we come to this concept of value hierarchy. And really the value hierarchy is our job is to try to triage product so uh, that we can get the highest dollar value for the item. But that highest dollar value always implies um, first resell. Can we resell the item back in the US? Uh, can we resell the item to another thrift operator? Um, or can it go into a vintage shop um, in the resale model? And if it can't, is there, a, is there a, a market abroad for that product? And I'll give you an example. In, in Guatemala, 80% of the people wear secondhand. So, you know, in the US, you know, what is it? Five, maybe 8% of the population shops in secondhand shops. But in places like Guatemala or El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, 80% of the populations shop secondhand. So it's really important to be able to sort and triage product that's good quality product for those markets. Um, but if it can't be resold in those markets, what can happen with it? And this is where we, we, where we start talking about using, used as an input to new. So... I was thinking, I'm looking at your, your, your dress on the side there, Nora. If you were to grow the organ, organic cotton for that dress, and assuming you just made it out of organic cotton, it takes 13 kilograms of carbon per kilogram of organic cotton grown. So if you're growing organic cotton, you, you've got to till the field, you got to put the seed in, you got to grow the plant, you got to harvest it, you got to gin it. You have to process it, you have to dye it. All of that would take 13 kilograms of carbon. But by our calculation, if you reuse a material that's already in the system, it only takes three kilograms of carbon per kilogram of reused material. So that, it, I'm gonna assume that that, uh, that dress probably weighs a kilogram, if I was guessing, maybe, maybe a little bit more because there's a lot of stitching in it. Well, you think about it, that dress is a, is a representation of 10 kilograms of carbon saved by trying to do upcycle, by, by upcycling. And I, I think that this is like a really critical point that the fastest route to a low carbon footprint product is yes, for sure, resale and reuse. That's, that's number one. But if we're gonna make new product, how do we make used and input to new at scale? How do we actually save that 10 kilograms 
of carbon per uh, kilogram of material made. And that's really significant. Like you think about it, if every dress in America had a 10 kilogram savings, what significant impact would that have on uh, the footprint of, 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 of any material made? So we, so we sort of start from this premise that, and I, I feel like it's one of the challenges that we're all gonna need to face with is to start looking at the lens of the world through a carbon lens as much as we do look at it as a cost lens, because uh, it'd be a new sort of cost to how things are made and why they're made. Same thing with your your Brooklyn bridge jacket. I'm sure it probably weighs a, a, a kilo, kilo and a quarter. Again, it's another 10 kilograms of carbon savings. And I I've, I don't know, I'm quite, I, I'm quite inspired by, by that. I think the other thing too is that, uh, and this, so I'm just speaking to the why should we be upcycling? And I'm sure everybody who's shown up to this is probably saying, well, I'm, I'm here because I believe in it anyways. But it's, I think it's always important to go back to why are we doing this? Um, and, and why we believe in, in what we're doing. But that, that jacket, if it has 10 kilograms of carbon savings, it, it almost should be the celebration of that jacket beyond it being a beautiful thing and beyond a representation of that, that bridge. It really is a representation of what a carbon, a low carbon footprint production could look like. Um, but it, but in our case, um, so I feel like does that does that cover the value hierarchy conversation? You, you feel like we get, we we answered that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And if you if can I say could, no if you want. <laughs> <laughs> if if I can just add to that, that it's for a piece like this, it's not just the carbon that we've saved. We've saved a significant amount of water because creating a new pair of jeans takes uh, a lot more water than using a secondhand pair of jeans as fabric. We've also saved space in landfills because that same pair of jeans could end up in landfill. And on top of that, it's made from production scraps. So in a typical uh, production, those scraps would just go to landfill as well. Um, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then if you want to talk about your upcycling process and how you guys do that at scale. Yeah. So, so the, um, um, yeah, we, so our focus has always been on, on post-consumer waste. So post-consumer being, and I really hate the word waste. So I'm going to come back to that, but our focus has been on post-consumer, meaning secondhand garments that don't have a home. I think one of the things that would really surprise people is that in when you're trying to resell and let's just well the conversation just so we stay narrow we'll say we'll stick to denim but one of the big surprises I think people would have is that the resale market for used denim around the world whether it be domestically or internationally uh, has actually limiting uh, uh, the reuse market has limits to things like style you know it's really hard to sell skinny jeans in a mark in in really hot countries so it'll be it'll be what um 37 degrees on monday in the uk well you're not going to wear your skinny jeans when it's 37 degrees um and in east africa or in west africa trying to sell tight skinny jeans in a 100 degree weather is really tough the other thing that i think would surprise people is that um, the reuse market for plus size jeans, so 36, 38s, 40s, 42s, all the way up to size 53, there's a limited world market for uh, plus size material. And so when one of the big uh, supply challenges within you know, used denim, as an example, is that we not only are sorting for um, shape and style, but also size, because you know uh, where in the world do you, do you find forty two and forty four inch waist jean customers? And so those automatically get put into the pile of these can be upcycled into something else. And I think people would be really surprised about the volume of plus size jeans. And it's, it's, it's a really important conversation because 
a lot of the conversations about circularity in clothing, people make the assumption that this is like cardboard or glass or cans, but this isn't. We're, we sell fashion and fashion is, is not only style, it's not only color, but it's also um, sizing. And so, you know, you get, a, you do get a lot of, of uh, short, short jeans that are, are plus size. So, you know, you got on the denim front, just alone, you have the, the waist size and then the length, length size. So the inputs, so our inputs at scale, we, we, we sort about four to four and a half million pairs of jeans a month at our facility in India. And so why, why do we, it's a good, and, and why India? Um, the reason, one of the reasons why we are in India is because the world sorting, so when people are sorting clothes for the reuse export markets, um, there's two or three places around the world where there are free zones, uh, where governments set up this area where clothes can come in and they sort out the good wearable clothes to be resold and re resell markets around the world. So in Karachi, in Pakistan, in the Gujarat, where we are, also in Dubai, are three of the world's large hubs for reselling, sorry, resorting clothes. So this, the non-wearable denim that is available to us uh, comes as a byproduct of sorting for the resale markets around the world. Um, and so that, that we, we essentially have put our upcycling facility next to this mine hub, uh, you know, sort of pre-COVID, the numbers uh, post-COVID have, have kind of turned wobbly a little bit, but as a way of an example into uh, the Gujarat, there's about 1,300 to 1,600 containers a month of used clothes brought in uh, to be resorted in that market. In Karachi, I think the number is around the 1,200 container uh, a month. So the, the one thing is when you're when you're upcycling at scale, we're in the business of fractions of fractions. You know, denim represents roughly seven percent of all the the clothes that come in, and then of that seven percent, let's say that fifty percent of that is um, good for reuse. So that means that three and a half percent is then to be sorted for upcycling. Um, so kind of, I tried to just go through the path of what would form the the product that we would uh, we would upcycle. So it's condition, it's style, it's size, and then there's another element which which I'm fascinated about, which is, um, and I'm and I'm for the purposes of this just conversation, we're sticking to denim here, uh, is also the the cotton the fiber content. So when you start to sort by fiber content. Uh, only about 9% of all genes are 100% cotton. Uh, and there's a, and this, and the fiber content is a really interesting conversation because unlike that jacket that I keep, I, I can't get my, my eyes off of, in that jacket, you've, you, you, you have what we refer to as the French fry problem. And this is like the first, the first conversation we'll have about that jacket. If you were to make uh, if you went to a brand uh, and said, okay, I'm going to make uh, 2,000 of these jackets, the buyers are going to want all 2,000 jackets to look exactly the same. And so we refer to this as the McDonald's French fry problem. The customer expectation is when they go to Paris or New York or London and buy their French fries, all the French fries are exactly the same. So how do you how do you design and build something so that the merchandisers, the traditional merchandisers, the people that assign the the PO say, I'm buying a black dress, which crosses this sort of first conversation on, on upcycling that, that we're quite fascinated about, which is this idea of the French fry problem. How do you actually deliver a product that's exactly the same across 2000 units? And in the case of denim, one of the problems is that if you can't make it consistent, then the brands, there's, this is an interesting sort of uh, bifurcation. Can some brands sell and celebrate the difference 
and recognize that if they if they bought if they place an order for two thousand of those uh, uh, jackets, that they're all going to be different. Or is the merchandiser going to say, no, we want all of them exactly the same? And that's at scale. That's the first. Uh, that's the first bridge uh, that we need to cross. And then, so how would we do that in the case of um, uh, upcycling denim? Well, on the one hand, what we could do is we could create a sorting methodology, again, going to that jacket. And this is where the, the two paths we could take. One path could be, let's sort the denim uh, by color tones and make groupings. Uh, and make, let's say, six groupings. And then if you were looking at that jacket in, in your corner there, you could say, okay, well, you can see that there's essentially six levels. There's a, a light, a light medium, a medium, a medium dark, and then a dark. And we could actually sort all of the genes into those categories and then design using uh, a paint by number system. I'm sorry to be gauche, but then you would assign a number to each one of those panels and then you could make it relatively consistent to the scale. So that, that is the, the, one of the first critical elements is, can you embrace the difference and will the large brand accept embracing the difference? Alternatively, do you take those, that, those panels and then you do something to them so they're all one thing and, and actually wash out the difference? So that each time you go to the McDonald's French fry, then you, <clears throat> you actually have a consistency of French fries. And that's, that's, that's one of the first journeys that's really an important conversation about. Uh, and then there's another element. So one of the things is if you take the second path, which is how do we make the inconsistent consistent, one of the challenges is what is the fiber content of uh, those components? Because if there's esters or if there's spandex or if there is some kind of man-made fiber, meaning non-cotton in there, the, a dye won't take to it. So how do you hurdle, how do you, how do you cross that hurdle at scale? Another, so, so we, we've got this element that we've got, uh, all of this denim coming in, we can sort by uh, color tone. We can sort by fabric type. We can sort by, um, um, and, then, and then there's another element here, which is thickness. You know, so you, you know if, you, if you imagine, if you go to the modern jean store, like a fast fashion brand, because the accountants get a hold of buying the thickness of the weight of the material, they're going to want a super thin, as thin as materials they can get away with. And then you'll go to some heritage brands where the denim is really thick. So one of the critical conversations is in a, in a typical garment business, you'll talk about the weight of denim. But the reality is, you know, you, as, as we all know, when, you, when you're weighing denim, you, you cut out a small circle and you weigh that and it'll say, okay, this is 12 ounce, this is six ounce, this is eight ounce. But the challenge is, <laughs> if you're sorting 4 million pairs of jeans a month, you can't uh, cut a circle out of every one of them and category and sort them by circle so by circle uh, weight. The way we get around that is by measuring it on the thickness. Because for your jacket or your, or your Brooklyn jacket, you're going to want a certain thickness of material um, to be able to have the structure of the garment. So I think that what's, what's really interesting is, you know, to, to, to manage scale for denim, just to kind of go back to this, we are managing fractions of fractions, but then we can put things in groups that look similar to each other. And then we can also put things in not only in, in look, but also fabric types and also thicknesses. If we can start doing that at scale, Really, at large scale, we can start making production of similar item things. I don't know. Does that is that making any sense to her? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it basically comes down to sorting. in In the main scheme of it, it's how well the sorting process and how similar, how many similar 
colors, fabric weights, thicknesses, and materials can be put together. Yeah, it, it comes down to sorting, but it, and, and it, it also comes down to where the opportunities are opened up is at scale. And I'll give you, I, I, I have like a personal inappropriate fascination with cashmere. I love cashmere. I like a cashmere sweater is like the most beautiful thing on the planet. But if you take cashmere as another example of an item that you can upcycle, as, a, as an example, uh, sweaters, let's say, represent, depending on where you get the mixed rag load, five to 8% of the general load of used mixed clothes is sweaters. Within that 8%, uh, maybe less than one tenth of a percent is cashmere sweaters. So if you had a sorting plant in New York and one in New Jersey and one in Brooklyn and one in uh, um, upstate New York, and they were all sorting sweaters, well, only 8% of your daily put throughput would be sweaters. And you would sort them between acrylic sweaters and wool sweaters, cotton sweaters, and then you'd have a little tiny pile of cashmere sweaters. The only way at which scale works at upcycling is by taking all the sweaters in the Eastern seaboard and then bringing them to one spot. And in that one spot, you'll actually make a 20 foot container a month of cashmere sweaters. And I think that one of the really critical conversations about upcycling at scale is finding the opportunity of where the uh, amalgamation of product is. It's kind of like the, in a way it's also, it's also because then you also get uh, sort of side industries that will set out because you have areas of, it, of excellence, right? In the, in the, in the Northeast the United States, there's a lot of car plants and then out of that car plant, so, you know, will be all these kind of ex, ex, industries around it because you have critical mass. This concept of critical mass in the apparel is really important, I think, for scale, for used to be an input to new. You need to have massive scale to be able to, to, to for, the, for upcycling to be, to move from being a bespoke thing to a scale thing. And, and I feel like I should, I think it's a really important conversation to say that I have a total respect for the bespoke upcycling. That has a place in the world and it's, and it's, and it's as, I, as I first saw you with your Brooklyn jacket, I fell in love with it because it's like, it's, it is a beautiful thing. What we're trying to do um, at Bank of Oak Services is how do we actually make commercial product commercial product being you know large scale branded product and offer used as a, as an input to new instead of uh new so both both have real value so i don't, i don't want to in any way um uh be diminutive to the bespoke thing it's just that the world i live in is is and the the, the real challenge is how do i how do i scale that savings of 10 kilograms per item of carbon against 2,000 items or 20,000 items. I don't know, somehow that's the, all of a sudden you go, oh, that's, you know, that's just, then all of a sudden if I, we can make 20,000 of those denim jackets at scale by sorting and grading to a level that's 20,000 times 10 kilograms is 200,000 kilograms of carbon savings. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's just embarrassingly that's how my brain thinks. But both are beautiful things. I have another question that's related to that. But first, I just want to show you side by side, because I think it's kind of what you're talking about with these jackets. So when we did production, and this is by no means uh, scale production, but it's, uh, it's what I call small batch. So on this panel, we sorted the pieces by small, uh, by light, medium, and dark denim. And so essentially, all of the panels look almost identical. And I can show you the third one. So it's definitely something that is scalable. And the key there is that you need to be able to have in one place, um, you know, in the case of that, in the in the case of the the you know the inner panel of that jacket, which is let's let's call it a light 
light indigo and you're going to make a thousand of those you're going to want a thousand light indigo pair of pants to make uh, trousers to make that one panel and so that that's why the 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 scale is critical to where you put this because it's it's you need that depth of product to be able to allow you to go out it and also i think that the other that's another really interesting conversation is being able to articulate to the design team that's working on that jacket is to say, hey, of this medium blue, there's actually this many, this, this much depth. Of the dark blue, there's, there's only 30% less of that depth. So that the understanding of what is, not only how do you sort, to what level you sort, but also uh, what's available in the sort is, uh, is I think is really, is that's part of the real fun reveal here is is being able to communicate what is available um is is really an important conversation um and, th and that's something that that our team at bank when we work with a a brand and they want to design a jacket our, it's our job not only to articulate uh what is possible but what is not possible based on the depth of available product at a certain size and, 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 and weight. And then that leads me to my other question is now we've talked about colors and fabric and fabric weight. Now, how do you guys approach upcycling at scale when it comes to cutting? Because we're dealing with all these different sizes and shapes and how is that scalable? Yeah, I think I think one of our big re revelations was figuring out to master the cutting, because one of the adva the advantage you have at upcycling is we don't have to grow this from a seed, we just got to pick it. So we have an we actually have an advantage on the fabric side, and you think about it this year, the price of cotton, organic cotton has doubled. So our advantage uh, over um, uh, organic cotton right now has never been better. On terms of, of purchasing the material but then the next the big problem is if you imagine that you're in a in a denim room and they roll out onto the cutting table 25 layers thick and then they have their knife cutter and they can cut out that pattern of the leg panel in a new comparing new production to us um, how do we actually take some of the advantages of uh, the knife cutters by way of example so just to say that again, if you're if you're working at a denim factory, you would layer out 25, 30, whatever layers of denim, then you would lay your pattern out and the knife cutter would cut 25 components at one time. And one of the big challenges with bespoke uh, upcycling is often somebody sits there with a pair of scissors and cuts out that component. So there's there's a couple of ways to get around that. One is, can you lay used uh, material out so that you can use a knife cutter and cut in layers? So can you use the same technology that that uh, that you would use on a um, in a new production facility and use a knife cutter to cut at scale? Number one. Number two, uh, we've employed a lot of uh, stamp cutters. So just taking, we have uh, five ton uh, stamp cutters and we can get metal dies made of those components and we can stamp two or three components at a time using our stamp cutter. And the speed of which is, uh, and that you don't have to open up the, in the case of denim, <coughs> you, don't, you don't have to open up the, the leg panel. You can actually just lay two or three legs on top of each other and um, uh, use the stamp cutter and the stamp cutter will press the components through. So cutting is a really critical part of, can you mimic the knife cutters? In some cases you can, if the components are big enough, but small enough to fit in the legs. And then secondly is if you can't do that, can you use the knife cutters or sorry, the, the stamp cutters to stamp out components at scale? And, and, and what's really fun there is, is the nesting of the material the nesting of the patterns on the leg components to be able to, to make those components is, is really critical. And when you guys do that, obviously then you have to be able to sort by 
brand and size and stack the same size like panels mm -hmm. on top of each other or within yeah, a reason? Yeah, I don't, I, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do it by brand for sure because, but you would do it by thickness or color. Uh, and you can align one side to be able to, um, uh, to be able to use the stamp cutter. So it doesn't necessarily have to be by brand and the shapes don't have to be exactly, as long as you have one edge all lined up, you can then put your stamp cutter on it. And, and, the, and for sure there's a waste element, but also remember we work with renew cell. So any of the cuttings that we come off can go to a renew cell. That's amazing. So, so it, I think what's, it is, there's a lot of really good work to be done on, um, and I've tried some things that haven't worked. We have like a, um, uh, from Italy at the last ITMA show, we bought um, a, um, excuse me, a uh, um, COVID brain, um, an ultrasonic cutter, which is like a pen cutter that you use and you cut on top of glass. And our thought was that that would be quicker. It, in the end, it, it, it does have some speed. And if you're doing something like nylon, where it, where it, it welds the edge as you cut it, that, that has real value. But it wasn't really fast. The hand rotary color cutters are okay if you're just cutting something straight or a box. But really to cut more complex patterns like your the back of your Brooklyn Bridge, uh, you're better off to get a die made and <clears throat> and cut those components on the dies. And what about deconstructing? Do you guys actually take secondhand clothing apart or yeah. do you just recycle the scraps? No, I, absolutely. No, no. So we, because we only do secondhand clothes, but also some of the things at scale is, um, what was it? Uh, Sung Tzu, The Art of War, the best war is the one not fought. If you can, if you can mine a component from a, a leg panel and not have to deconstruct it, you're better off to do that than, so if you're using your stamp cutter and you can cut out the, the left side of your bridge and not have to depick a gene, then why, why bother depicking it? Uh, so it's, so, so that, that's a, a really important, um, an element of it as well. The best war is the one not fought. It's a little bit inappropriate nowadays, but maybe more importantly. Or maybe even more important. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, so I, I think that, that your advantage is that the advantage of using upcycled material is it's going to be cheaper. The fabric is going to be cheaper than um, new cotton. However, the labor to sort it is going to be much higher. And then you've got to figure out a way to do an equivalent cutting because then when you do the stitch and sew you're really at the same parity as a new a new garment manufacturer once the components go cut and then to the stitch and sew section you're in the equivalent space um the real achilles heel is to be effective on the cutting a cutting part at, at scale so if the time if the labor goes into the sorting then the rest of the process can be pretty much equivalent to normal production the, the 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 sorting absolutely is if it's done right but also the cutting needs to be managed effectively because new production has an advantage like particularly if you're doing something like jersey and you think you go to a t-shirt factory and they cut 100 t-shirt components at a time you're gonna have a hard time doing that on, on an upcycle level so so how do you how do you how do you take the advantage that you can from um, how do you take the advantage you can from either a knife cutter or the uh, or the the component cutting? Yeah, are are you familiar with um, Eileen Fisher and her tiny factory? You've been there, right? I haven't, I, some, of, some of our team have been there and I, and I totally applaud them on what they're trying to do. It's, you know, our goal, our goal is to do tens of thousands of items. Uh, and, yeah. and that's, and so our, our approach is, 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 is quite different. The other thing is too, is that I think that's one of the things that is really critical is that 
one needs to be agnostic about where their raw material comes from in terms of a brand perspective. Um, so so I, I fundamentally am against brands doing take back programs. Like we, I think after a number of years, we all could admit that the take back programs really don't work. Um, like the yield rates are really low. The, the dollar is spent on is really high. I, what's really important for us is if that jacket to your left, right, is um, is made from Lee Levi Wrangler jackets combined. Who cares? It's just going to be a beautiful jacket. And I think one has to be agnostic about the brands that you're converting. You're, what we're looking for is material attributes rather than um, uh, brands brand specifics. Because if you try to narrow your focus to a brand, you've made that first step of the process, which we already talked about the sorting, that much harder, right? Of, of, of all the Levi's we get, or of all the jeans that we get, if we said, okay, well, we're only gonna upcycle Levi's, you know, we're probably only 7% of all the jeans we get. And so you, know, you really limit yourself to, um, I, yeah, I, I, I feel like this conversation about being brand agnostic is really, is really important. That's interesting. Um, I guess my what I my, the reason I mentioned uh, Eileen Fisher is that the, the way they do the production because they're collecting back their own pieces, they're getting all similar shapes. And because, for example, they don't have a very trend driven uh, style, so when they collect back pants, there's maybe like five different pant shapes. So they're able to sort them by those five shapes and then they're able to sort the fabric because it's the same fabric that they produced um, and they don't vary the fabric that often either so then they're able to deconstruct the pieces and lay them on um, the panel so like they're able to deconstruct like 100 pairs of pants take all the same pant leg they're all the same shape and stack them so that that was my reason for for um mentioning them but those are all like really good points about limiting yourself when you're collecting back from a certain brand for sure and um and they're certainly not doing it on that large of a scale yeah it's 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 if we want to challenge that that use can be an input to new at scale um one of the first conversations we need to have with brands is this is going to be a brand agnostic uh input and, um, but that also presents some other challenges that is really important to, 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 that we talk about at scale as well is that if you're going to deliver to a brand, a large international brand, let me refer it, you, you will need to meet the standards of a fabric, a new fabric supplier. And there are standards that you, that they, that they legally won't give up. So testing of the material, um, you know, they, if, if a large brand was buying that jacket behind you, they'd want to have some sort of documentation about testing. What testing did you do on the material to make sure that it was compliant? And, um, and so that's like another, another series of conversations that is, that I'm, I get, that is a barrier to scale is how do you set up a testing protocol? Uh, another one as well is uh, washing. So in our facility, um, we're, you know, we, I, I'm, we're, we're, we, we spent a lot of energy developing a system. So to your point, I, I, which I really like, it's, I, I'm, I, I'm approached the conversation from a carbon perspective, but there is a water perspective. But if we're using shed loads of water to wash denim, uh, we're going to lose ground on our speech that we're saving water to not grow cotton. So at our facility, we set up a, a water capture system to recirculate the water back into uh, the wash plant. So we have like a reverse osmosis system that uh, when the water went after a garment is our components have been washed, it recaptures the water, puts it through the RO system and then reuses back the water again. Um, so I think uh, one of the conversations about upcycling at scale 
uh, which is going to lead me to another point as well, is that um, we need to figure out the water conversation. How do we make sure that we're capturing and reusing as much of the water as possible to be able to, because you can wash cotton to a, um, uh, um, you can wash cotton to a hospital grade clean, uh, which is which is the level in which we're washing to. However, we got to make sure that we're treating that water really well. And another point I, I feel like I really want to bring up, and I'm I'm really one should never be proud. That's not a good thing to be. But the business invested in uh, doing a Smeta audit. audit. So the, there, are, there are audit firms that audit new production facilities. And um, uh, we invested heavily in having a, a third party independent auditor come in and audit our, um, our facility. And I would encourage that anybody who is looking at how do, I, how do we have a facility where um, uh, we audit our sorry that we're going to do this at scale if used it's going to be an input to new manufacturing and we're going to create a level playing field between us we need to be honest about the conditions of our facility the conditions of our plant the standard of which we operate has to to be at par to a supplier another supplier that's doing new and uh and we need to op we need to open up our kimono and, and have people examine us to be able to say, you do meet the standards or you don't meet the standards and here are the things you need to fix. Uh, so I, so that, that, that would, that's not an easy process. Uh, any, I mean, any, anybody in the, in the new garment business will say that it's arduous to be audited and opening your kimono is never a very comfortable thing to do. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but there are uh, known unknowns. There are things we, we, we didn't know that we're awfully glad we did do the audit process. So if you go to the SMETA, uh, SMETA audit, audit site, you'll see that our facility has been audited. And, and there are things that we didn't know that we should have, we should have had in place and, and we have since put in place. <coughs> but I, 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 I think that the auditing process and having a third party evaluator come in and see your facility is a really critical one to successfully doing this at scale. So it's, I, I really, I, I genuinely believe that, um, um, uh, excuse me, I really do believe that used can compete with new. It should be part of the landscape of fashion, but we should also as upcyclers take on the responsibility of a fully uh, being as fully transparent and audited uh, by third party uh, 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 auditors. And that will come with an enormous amount of growth for the business, but also a growth of, of what part of the maturing of, um, of, 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 of where our industry can go. And, and it's, it's just part of learning because there's always more you can do, right? And that's, it's interesting to learn also the advantages of being at scale because washing for a small brand like mine I don't have the resources to go to a washing facility that recycles the water. <laughs> so for each piece that Norism produces, we're not, you know, we're throwing away that water because I go, you know, I go to like an industrial laundromat, but that's about where it ends, right? And so when you're doing thousands and thousands of pieces and you're able to have that technology, then it makes the process even cleaner. Yeah, I, I, to be fair, I think in, in most modern industrial cities, like and, you, know, you being in one of the best of the world, uh, you'll have a, a closed loop system where the water gets, you know, what, what I remember once going to New York and they said that the water in the tap has been through seven kidneys. <laughs> so, uh, but, I, but I think if you're in, a, in an environment where you're in, a, in, a, in an open system, um, you know, whether it be in Vietnam or in India, uh, where they don't have modern infrastructure, it's, it's problematic, and you need to own that yourself. Got it. Got it. So, so I, yeah, I would so, I would say that yeah, on a, in a in an industrial scale level, I think some of the reasons why some of the you know the large industrial houses will also have their own internal is because they have to pay for water, um, and water is expensive. 
and could be could be more expensive as time goes on. But um, anyhow, I, I think it's just one more complexity that I'm that's fun to try to figure out. You know, is is the water or even even the power that pushes our plant? We have a uh, 120 solar panels on the roof pushing our our facility, um, and uh, you know, which we tie back into the grid. And you're trying to figure out how do you offset the the power consumption because the stamp cutting machines they're large industrial presses they're big hydraulic motors they take power to do this so you know one <coughs> one doesn't want to be hubris about the fact that we're not that's why we still have three kilograms of carbon footprint we're gonna we'll try to mitigate or lower that number and we're also shipping stuff around the world i think one of the the big um i i find this really fascinating that that you know, people will point to us and say, well, why, why are you doing it in India? And why aren't you doing it in Brooklyn? And so number one, as I said, the waste is there as a byproduct of the sorting business. So number one, we kind of followed the waste. The other is that uh, we had, we had, last year, we had uh, taken on a, a master's student from the Harvard Sustainability Program who had done a carbon calculator of what does it cost to ship a container of clothes from Detroit to the facility in India. And um, and I think it's really important uh, uh, work that we're trying to figure out in our own business of what is um, the beginning and the end of the carbon calculation. <coughs> but it's, I, you know, I think it's um, uh, on a garment per garment basis because we fit 50,000 garments in a container because it bailed, not shipped loose or in boxes or folded and you know the amount the carbon footprint per garment is is negligible and especially against you know trying to grow the cotton for the, the same thing but it's still i think it's important to be honest about that there is a cost you know so right everything has a cost <laughs> everything has a cost <clears throat> we, and we start with the definition of what those costs are and that's that's important and do you see um, technology or more technologies on the forefront having a bigger role in making upcycling more scalable and more commonplace in the future? It's funny. I I do feel and 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 I'm I'm uh, I don't want to sound like a heterite, but sometimes I think when we're when we're faced with problems. Modernity always say, let's let's throw tech at it. There'll be a techno technological solution. And sometimes it's just work work. Like we just gotta work. Like this is work. It's not not any more difficult than that. Now, having said that, um, you know, I think a lot of people would point to um, you know, the the new sorting technologies that are out there. Um it's it's hard to be brave to spend the the spend level on the sorting tech when the requirements for what will that material be in X months, uh, that, that much more difficult. Uh, uh, let me rephrase, let me restate that question. The, the sorting technology is at, on a trajectory like this and the requirements for the, the recyclers is on a trajectory like this. Both are moving at a quick pace. And so I don't think it's settled yet on which tech is gonna be sorted for uh, which uh, which recycling solution. But I think one of the big conversations that we, we are trying to ensure happens is that there's a big conversation, for example, in the, the European textile strategy is it's either reuse or refiber. And people are forgetting about your beautiful world, which is upcycling. And I feel like that's a really critical conversation is, we want to make sure that this step in the hierarchy of, of value of materials is not missed. I, we would rather cut up those components and turn them into that beautiful jacket than shred them and turn them into new fiber. And so I think that it's, it's, it is often very much lost that it's either reuse or refiber. And this component of upcycling is left out of the conversation. And I, you know, I, and and that's why I'm I'm really excited about having this conversation about upcycling at scale because we want to demonstrate to brands that you don't have to 
go to the fiber level to be able to use used as an input to new at scale. Yep, yep, amazing. And um, so I'm gonna open it up to questions before we wrap up. Does anybody have any questions for Stephen? And um, if you guys want to raise your hand, get on the microphone, turn your microphone on, um, or type questions into the chat. We're also answering questions on on veg because I my vegetable garden is about to explode and I'm really excited about my vegetables. <laughs> so if we don't want to talk about upcycle, we can talk about vegetables. <laughs> Anybody have gardening questions? <laughs> I have the most beautiful calabria that I've ever had this year. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a few comments, um, but. Let's see. Someone, uh, so Monica said this was all very new material, and I appreciate hearing about your experience. Is that is that about my collaborate about the denim? <laughs> <laughs> I also have a really healthy uh, crop of celerac this year. I'm really quite excited about. It. It's sort of a new new change for me. Um, yeah, and I, I think that this is what's really fun is if we can talk about used as an input to new at scale, upcycling at scale. I think it's just important that the brands are aware and designers are aware that this is possible. Like, you know, that, you know, what we're doing is possible. Oh, we, so we have a question from Claire. What do you think about upcycling old with new, a hybrid? And I think yeah, that's so, a great question. Yeah, very much so. And, and um, you know, the, the, the work by example, um, you know, as, as, I, as we talked about in New York, you know, um, we're really proud that Beyond Retro and Bank of Oak Services, we've made uh, cut out the components for the upper for the Chuck Taylor. But there are many new elements in that shoe. I think having used as an input to new doesn't mean the whole thing has to be made from used. Some of it can be used. Some of it can be um, components. And I think this is actually a really important conversation. It's not only that it that some of the elements of the item can be new, but also that the handwriting of the original brand and the construction can by it can be by the brand's handwriting. In other words, um, if you're going to make let's 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 pick on a brand and we'll say that Tommy Hilfiger has a, a way they want to construct things, we can deliver components to Tommy Hilfiger. And I, I would challenge them to do that. And they that the handwriting of constructions can still be Tommy Hilfiger's construction. And it could be maybe just one element being used. But the 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 idea of us being component manufacturers, which is probably where we where our strengths lie in sorting the product and grading it, cutting the components, and then those components going to a third party manufacturer who understands the handwriting of the brand that actually might be more 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 at scale and they have the advantage of knowing how to construct whatever the item is at scale all day long and then the the component fitting into the production is then seamless it's it it, it just instead of it coming from the cutting room floor of of their own factory it comes from the cutting room of our facility uh, but that's that's a good point, and I I, I should I, it, we should mention it that it's not just about cutting up the whole thing doesn't need to be used. A component of it can be. Of course, I'm gonna I'm gonna argue for more and more of it to be used because that's more and more of the carbon footprint reduction. But when, we got to be somewhat realistic as well. For sure, for sure, <laughs> and that that makes a lot of sense. I have a quick question. One more question um, before we wrap up. So I've read recently that the impact of fast fashion and the poor quality clothing that is being produced it more recently versus in the past is causing even vintage stores and secondhand stores to have um, more issues finding quality clothing to resell. And even with denim, um, for example, 
most brands now make denim with stretch and they don't make the non-stretch denim. The non-stretch denim is the best kind of denim that I have found to upcycle. So how do you think that the, the lower quality clothing currently being produced and probably unfortunately will be continued to be produced in the future is going to impact your ability or all of our ability to source quality secondhand materials in the future? Or do you think that there will always kind of be a workaround or we'll just have to be more creative? You know, we, I think we all, um, we certainly are, are can be we could we could we could put, we could be victims of the circumstance where we can be innovative and figure a way around it and i'm i'm just of the nature to figure out and around it for sure only nine percent of genes that come through right now are 100 percent caught um but i would i would say with 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 some degree of excitement that uh the conversations we're having with brands and designers is there's a return to 100 percent cotton and and they're stepping away from uh, the elastic in the jeans or the spandex in the jeans or, or, or what have you. I think the, the, the real challenge with some of the fast fashion product of being the poly cotton blends and the poly being greater in blend, it does make it problematic to, to upcycle and, and creates its, its own sets of challenges. Um, but it's funny. I, 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 I I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out the negatives. I try to figure out what are the positives in front of us. And it, I, and I, I feel as if we can, we can innovate around many of the problems, but I also think that if we participate in the conversations, like for example, you know, you know, we, we you know, we participate with accelerating circularity as uh, a really good, I would really encourage everybody to check these guys out. Um, it's about being a voice at the table and reminding the brands that, you know, de designing with for circularity is a really critical conversation. And, you know, that the, the work that we did with, um, and, and a lot of people did really great work with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, gene redesign program. There, there is a conversation where we're reminding the brands the importance of making things out of mono materials rather than, you know, these, uh, science soup uh, materials. So, um, yeah, there's there is a responsibility uh, to keep our conversation that 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 for used to be an input to new is a lot better that it's in the case of denim 100 percent cotton, um, or in a lot case, or not only that it's 100 percent cotton but it's of decent weight cotton because 100 percent cotton is like you know six ounce denim. What are you going to do with that? So um, I think that it's, what's really exciting is that, that brands are thinking about circularity and thinking about, um, I, I tend to be a Buddhist when it comes to clothes. It's not that an item is dead, it's an item is looking for its next life. And so how do we create an environment so the next life is, a, is, a, is as fulfilling as the first life? I love that. Thank you. Um, and I think that's that's a great way to wrap this up. So thank you so much, Stephen, for being on this workshop and for sharing all of your insight and ideas and just about all the amazing things you guys are doing with upcycling right now. Hey, back at you, man. A total respect. I love your jacket and love what you're doing. It's like... <laughs> Hey, it, you, you're an amazing beacon in, in Brooklyn, man, for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> all right, guys. Bye. All right. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>